In the weather today, severe storms return to the forecast as an active southern stream begins redeveloping in the Great Plains. Welcome, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us on this channel. As we all know, the YouTube algorithm isn't what it used to be. Some channels get the royal treatment, others not so much. That's something I've dealt with for years now, and it's probably because I don't really put my face on here much. Maybe I'll start doing that soon. But here, I believe you all are not here because of the algorithm or seeing a face on the screen. You're actual hobbyists and weather professionals looking to understand this stuff a little bit better. Some of you are here because of my books. Some of you want to hear it from a real Air Force forecaster and not some random uncredentialed YouTuber. And others because you like the low-key, nuanced understanding I bring to this channel. Regardless, I'm happy with this little community we've built here and I thank you. If you haven't already, I ask that you introduce yourself in these comments, myself and others. We would like to know you a little bit better. I've seen a lot of names in here regularly, and I do enjoy reading what's in here and seeing where you all are from. All right, let's go ahead and get started with the surface map. This afternoon, we have a strong weather system moving through the central plains, Baraclinic Low, around Wichita, Medicine Lodge and Pratt, warm front down into Arkansas, and a cold front into the Panhandles. Also, we have a triple point around Wellington, Texas, dry line extending southwestward towards uh, Eastland, Ranger, and down towards Junction and Del Rio. Some low dew points in the wake of that dry line, and you can see the characteristic westerly flow. Dew point of 27 at El Paso with west winds. Anyway, one notable thing about this season is that we don't have a death ridge. We've been contending with that for years. You know, you get up to mid-May, big ridge builds in in the upper levels and things shut down. This has been really active and that's because we've had an active southern stream. You can see it here on this chart. If you take a look at those red lines, those red dashed lines in here, you can see they form a little ribbon like that. And it goes all the way into the Gulf Coast region. There's a lot of those ribbons and off into the Atlantic. And we can also see it on the top left edge. That represents altogether the southern stream. Let's go to the upper levels. And I forgot to mention what those red lines were on that last chart. That was the 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness, basically a measure of the density or temperature in the lower part of the troposphere. And where they're packed together, that's going to represent a thermal gradient. We go up to 250 millibars, about 34,000 feet, and the colored lines here, those are going to be the ice attacks, the wind speed, and the red lines indicate the temperature. And what we see here is a northern stream running something like that, and a southern stream. So there is a little bit of crossover right there in the western U.S., but overall it is active. This is a subtropical jet, maybe with some polar front jet characteristics. And then up north, this is definitely the polar front jet. So a little bit of jet energy wherever you go, north or south, there's something going on. And we've also got medium scale troughing through the western U.S., a couple of smaller troughs in the east coast region, and a short wave right there very small scale wave. And overall, all this troughing corresponds to a long wave. And we've had a long wave kind of sitting there over the US over the past week, maybe two weeks. I don't know, my memory is not that good. But yeah, things have definitely been active. And on the West Coast, this is kind of a change. The subtropical ridge starting to show up. And that tends to be a warm season pattern. We see ridging aloft, and high pressure at the surface. The pressure out there in the Pacific can be as high as 1040 millibars in July. Definitely some concerns at the Storm Prediction Center, a SPC enhanced risk, which is just below moderate risk. That's going to be in the Texas Panhandles and northwestern Oklahoma. 
Looking for an enhanced risk this afternoon, primarily straight line wind risk. Inverted V soundings in place, and that favors downbursts and microbursts. Not so much tornadoes. The SPC mesoscale discussion gives some idea what they're thinking about. You can see that cold front right there through the panhandles. Looking for storms along the intersection of the moisture axis right there. And storms are already going up. And there they are. That's going to be around plain view between there and Amarillo, right there along that interstate. And it does look like some somewhat linear characteristics, some other cells down towards Clovis as well, and quite a bit of patchy cirrus in that same area. Additional storms further east on the higher terrain around Santa Rosa and just east of Las Vegas, New Mexico, way up there at the top. And that's when we look at the surface chart and look at the conditions. And what we see here is northerly flow back here becoming easterly. So this is going to be a little bit of upslope flow there in northeastern New Mexico. The actual polar front boundary somewhere in here. Not sure what it's doing in New Mexico. I think it's probably trailing off a little bit like that. But definitely you can see that convergence right there along the cap rock. Winds coming together out of the north and south. And the dry line. Where's that dry line? We go from 65 at Wichita Falls down to 52, down to 44. So that's going to put the dry line. Maybe you can go maybe something like that. You can maybe bring it a little bit further east, something like that. So it's going to be right in there. So the moisture gradient a little bit diffuse around Childress. So what's going on? Probably just off the surface, there's a better flow of moisture right up there towards that boundary. And, of course, the higher terrain helps out as well to generate that convection. Deeper moisture out to the east, 65-degree dew points along Interstate 35, but apparently, I don't know, is that not doing very much? Let's take a look out there. Yeah, I think a few cells going up. Looks a little bit elevated. Yeah, it looks like elevated shower activity. But a pretty good patch of cumulus and stratocumulus further north up near Alva and Enid. And a little bit of cyclonic turning in the wind flow. Definitely quite an active day there in Florida. Numerous thunderstorms. We go to the radar. And it appears there's a little bit of a break there. But they are under a severe thunderstorm watch covering Orlando, Tampa, Melbourne, and a lot of areas in here. So that's going to be for this afternoon. And they are looking for that outflow boundary, helping to sustain ongoing storm activity there. Strong upper level winds. You can see that with the rapid flow west to east, helping to support organized development. But straight line photographs will keep these mostly as clusters. And also some activity there in the Carolinas. A few thunderstorm complexes around Charlotte to Greenville, Spartanburg. And they do have a severe thunderstorm watch in effect, basically this area right here. A weak polar front through that area, moderate bulk shears, and a weakly capped air mass supporting numerous cells through that region. And some of those will be strong. And you can see numerous storms further to the west. That is characteristic of a cold core low. So that's going to shut down after we lose surface heating. And there's what we're talking about, 700 millibars, about 10,000 feet. Maybe not so much a closed low, but very strong troughing through the Appalachians and the red lines, the isotherms indicating very cool temperatures in the mid-levels of the troposphere. So we're looking at, uh, let's see, it's going to be 8, 6, 4, 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, and that is pretty cold for this time of year. That means cold over warm, warm being near the surface, and that is your textbook static instability. And returning to that surface chart, you can see that thunderstorm activity associated with that front right there in the Carolinas. Let's take a look out in the Pacific, see what's going on, and we find that Pacific high there off the coast of Oregon. Heading north into British Columbia and Alberta, a series of polar fronts. They've had major problems with wildfires once again. You can see the smoke symbol right there. I think that's going to be around Valley View, Alberta. 
an air quality advisory for northern Alberta, Fort McMurray, and Fort Nelson, and air quality statements all across this region right here. Hopefully, we're not getting into an active wildfire season. But as you can see here, drought conditions are back, so that's not really looking good for this summer. Heading up into Alaska, temperamental spring weather, deep southerly flow, strong baroclinic lift, helping to produce snow. And we do have blizzard conditions in the far western part of the Seward Peninsula up towards Point Hope and Point Lay. Those expire later tonight. And winter weather advisory in the interior of the Seward Peninsula. Or a graphic lift helping to generate those heavier snowfall amounts. A little bit warmer in the Alaskan interior. Rather stagnant pattern. I probably could have drawn a high pressure area right there across the Yellowknife region. Cold in Nunavut, but that area under southerly flow and temperatures warming into the 20s and 30s. And then dropping south into Canada itself. Not sure how many viewers we have there. I, I do know we have a few in the Vancouver, Victoria area. Not so sure about out east. But there it is, ridging through Ontario, driving some of that cooler air, 50s and 60s, into the Great Lakes region with a frontal boundary moving into the Canadian Maritimes. The big weather story over the next 48 hours is going to be storms in Texas. This is the forecast for this evening from the GFS model, that frontal boundary sagging down towards Childress and Lubbock and the model generating thunderstorm act activity there. You can see the main moisture axis further to the east, a little bit of a deficit around Childress down to Abilene, so kind of slow for that complex to come together. Looks like that's going to track up the boundary this evening. There's 1 a.m. Things will regenerate, and there comes a moisture surge for tomorrow out of the Rio Grande Valley through the Edwards Plateau into the I-20 corridor. That's going to be about midday right there. Cyclogenesis around Midland. Convergence of the wind field right in here. And that should get storms going around that moisture axis. So tomorrow looking a little bit more significant around the Abilene area, maybe down towards Coleman, maybe up to Wichita Falls. The models are really all over the place with where things are going to develop. So basically this entire region under the gun dry line set up right there in the Texas Hill Country and storms possible anywhere within this region. Mostly north of I-10 up to Interstate 20 and 30, Dallas Fourth area, Waco, East Texas and so on. But what we do know for sure is that this activity will track eastward overnight by early Friday. Most of it should be into Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi with this little occlusion up there in Oklahoma not really doing very much. Maybe a little bit of activity later in the afternoon as that drifts to the east. A little bit of redevelopment for late Friday around the Austin-San Antonio area. Then we'll just have to see about later on. Looks like the atmosphere is kind of overturned. Cool through this area here. But we're going to be seeing a major warm-up. Okay, let's take a look at the forecast. There's those storms in the Texas Panhandle along that front. And as we go forward through Thursday, we do have a weather prediction center, moderate risk for excessive rainfall in East Texas, central Louisiana, expecting two to four inches there as that complex develops and tracks eastward. Again, we're not exactly sure how that's going to come together, but it is going to focus on this region right there and the heavier amounts probably around Lufkin out towards uh, what is that Fort Polk Louisiana all right anyway that's going to track eastward the frontal the, the frontal system itself kind of gets hung up there in the western Gulf Coast region and most of the storm activity should be along or east of there so we're already at early Saturday we are looking at a weather prediction center moderate risk of excessive precip in southern Mississippi and Alabama. Then going into the remainder of the weekend, we get somewhat of a break, but conditions will be warming up in Texas. You can see that deep southerly flow, the air mass a little bit drier, and temperatures will be coming up to 107 at Del Rio, 101 at Midland, 105 at Laredo, 
And for Monday, maybe one degree hotter at those stations. There's the dry line, a weak Pacific front, and an even stronger Pacific front out there in the central Rockies. Tuesday, well, we're going to be in the middle of a heat wave there in Texas. 107 at Del Rio, 94 at Austin, 97 at San Antonio. And as we get into Wednesday, a very thick moisture return into Texas, convergence along that boundary. So we're probably looking for rain to set up once again Wednesday or Thursday in Texas. Looks like a pretty active pattern. Another wave coming in from the Pacific. So, yes, just never-ending stream of showers, thunderstorms through the Great Plains. We're going to be focused on that region right there for quite a while. And, yeah, we'll take a look at the precipitable water. You can see that moisture coming up for Thursday. This is going to be the big storm day for tomorrow. Right there, the moisture axis hitting that boundary around Abilene to Stephenville, down to Brownwood. And then shifting east, carrying that moisture into Mississippi and Alabama for Friday. And before we close it up, a quick look at the radar out of Amarillo. A lot of these cells have just popped up in the last one to two hours. Starting to see those severe thunderstorm watches popping up. Another one for this right mover coming right down that highway from Clayton to Dalhart. So this is not really in proximity to any deep moisture, so it may be a little bit elevated. Mostly wind is probably going to be the primary hazard. But of course, the Weather Service will continue to watch that. And then further south, Again, we're not looking for a whole lot of organization on these cells as the moisture is a little bit scarce. But, you know, it is May, and as Tim Marshall always used to say, when it's May, you chase. And a quick look at the high-resolution rapid refresh, showing a little bit of a trend towards upscale growth into a couple of small MCSs. Nothing too significant, but it should persist overnight. And then by tomorrow morning around dawn, looking something like this, maybe kind of an elevated MCS right there around Vernon down towards Abilene. And on the very last frame there, it appears to strengthen a bit, maybe with that strong low-level jet coming northward. And really, it's going to be it's going to be hard to say exactly what we're going to be looking at for tomorrow afternoon. It really depends on where this MCS goes, how much it strengthens, and where all these boundaries end up. So we shall see. And that is all for this edition of Forecast Lab. We close out with some footage in the San Antonio area back on Sunday. Thanks to Greg for this footage. And we'll see you back here for another edition on Friday. Take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.